We are seeing the results of the genocide that Canada committed here. 751 unmarked graves. The Roman Catholic residential school has impacted us intensely. But we are proud people. We learned how to not like who we were. Canada will be known as a nation who tried to exterminate the First Nations. Now we have evidence. We will not stop until we find all of our children. This is Global National with Donna Friesen. Another reckoning for this country, another horrific reminder of Canada's shameful history. On this site of the former Maryville Indian Residential School east of Regina lie hundreds of unmarked graves. The Cowessis First Nation says ground-penetrating radar has detected more than 600 of them, possibly as many as 751. Flags now mark the site of each suspected grave. Many are spaced one meter by one meter apart. Not all are believed to be children. The First Nation says adults may have been buried here too. Some used to have headstones that were removed. The grave site is, is there and it's real. And if you were to see it, there are 751 flags when you look at it. We are treating this like a crime scene at the moment. Good evening and thanks for joining us. The former chair of Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission had said Canadians should prepare themselves for more discoveries like the one in Kamloops. This one is even bigger. The unmarked graves found on Cowess's First Nation in Saskatchewan could be more than triple the number found in Kamloops, B.C. Ryan Kessler has our top story tonight and a warning the details in it are disturbing. The discovery of hundreds of unmarked graves confirms what members of Cowess's First Nation have known for decades. The Roman Catholic Residential School has impacted us intensely. We are not asking for pity, but we are asking for understanding. We need time to heal, and this country must stand by us. Investigators have used ground-penetrating radar to carry out their grim search. It detected 751 unique radar hits below ground, and while there is a margin of error, the chief says it's confirmation of more than 600 unmarked graves near the former Maryville Residential School. We want to make sure when we tell our story that we're not trying to make numbers sound bigger than they are. Chief Cadmus DeLorme says it's not a mass grave. At one point, there were individual markers at the burial sites, but Catholic Church officials removed them in the 1960s. DeLorme says that was illegal, and the site is now being treated like a crime scene. Another chief representing 74 First Nations in Saskatchewan says residential schools were Canada's concentration camps, the sites of crimes against humanity. An assault on, a first, on First Nation people. We are proud people. The only crime we ever committed as children was being born Indigenous. Barry Kennedy remembers being an altar boy at the Maryvale Indian Residential School and burying a deceased child. We buried him out behind the back of the church. He says school officials inflicted sexual violence upon students and one of his classmates disappeared in the night. He heard them begging for help, right? Uh, no one would ever go and help. Everybody was always too scared. And, uh, and Brian was one of those individuals and just he never returned. The Pope needs to apologize for what has happened to the Maryville Residential School. The Archbishop of Regina offered an apology of his own Thursday, pledging to turn the sentiment into meaningful and concrete action. Today's findings just shows the absolute urgency of uh, of that work, the need to do everything we can to support uh, Kawasis and other Indigenous communities. Leaders say this is just the first phase of what will be a process that takes years to see through. This is phase one. Uh, we're going to identify all the names we can uh, using all the records. Uh, we will put um, a headstone and a name to, to each of them. Permanent reminders of the horrific legacy of residential schools that Canada will be forced to confront with each future discovery of unmarked graves. Ryan Kessler, Global News, Saskatoon. 
According to a 2017 University of Regina report, there are more than 21,000 residential school survivors in Saskatchewan. The former Maryville School was for First Nations children in southeastern Saskatchewan and southwestern Manitoba. It opened in 1899 and was run by the Roman Catholic Church. According to the University of Regina, the federal government assumed responsibility for it in 1968. In 1981, the Cowessus First Nation took control and the school closed in 1997. Two years later, it was demolished, but the church and the cemetery are still there. Beside that cemetery is where the unmarked graves were discovered. There were about 140 other residential schools in Canada. To call them schools is actually a misnomer. Indigenous children were robbed of their language, their culture, and their family connections. There was malnutrition and physical and sexual abuse. And the lack of information about missing children and accountability for what happened persists to this day. As Eric Sorensen reports, the path to reconciliation remains a long one. Just days before Canada Day, a dark and inexorable truth is unfolding in this country. Burial sites in Saskatchewan and British Columbia may be just the first of dozens still to be uncovered. St. Anne's was a residential school in Ontario. Evelyn Corkmaz, a survivor. I expect them to find bodies buried. Uh, it, it would not surprise me at all. This is what residential school people have been saying for years, but no one has been listening. What happened at residential schools is not new to the powerful in this country. In 1907, Cindy Blackstock's organization runs walking tours in Ottawa. One landmark is the building where the chief medical officer, Peter Bryce, first brought to light inspections of residential schools more than a hundred years ago for the Department of Indian Affairs. He catalogued the horrors of children dying in high numbers. He called it a national crime and he was ignored and children continued to die at residential schools. How many of those deaths could have been prevented had Canada listened to the advice of their own chief health medical health officer in 1907? He was the whistleblower that never was listened to. The harm, she says, is still evident today in perpetually poor housing and unclean drinking water. It's not historical. It's playing out right now. It's not enough for the government to say sorry. They have to change their behavior. For many Indigenous people, Canadians are only beginning to recognize the trauma that still needs to be addressed. Let's have a discussion so that we can move towards healing because right now we're not near healing if we can't even talk about the truth of the genocide that's happened in Canada. The chief of the Cowessus Nation says he wants a different future for his child. In Canada one day, hopefully when my four-year-old is old, we'll have reconciliation through and through, through the spirit and intent. It's been a heavy burden for children like Evelyn Korkmaz to carry for the rest of their lives. No more promises, no more words. We need concrete action now. There are calls for the records of every residential school to be made public, a painful reckoning that is just beginning. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. The discovery in Kamloops has prompted the U.S. to investigate its own history of forcing Indigenous children into boarding schools. It will seek to identify facilities and sites where students may be buried. The plan was announced this week by the first Native American Secretary of the Interior, Deb Haland, who says she felt sick to her stomach when she heard about Kamloops. I come from ancestors who endured the horrors of Indian boarding school assimilation policies carried out by the same department that I now lead. We must shed light on the unspoken traumas of the past, no matter how hard it will be. Native American boarding schools operated from 1860 to 1978. Hundreds of thousands of children were forcibly removed from their homes to be culturally assimilated. Many are still unaccounted for. There is some support for those who need it. The Indian Residential School Survivors Crisis Line is available in Canada 24 hours a day. The number is toll-free, and you can speak in confidence. The number is 1-866-925-4419. The federal cabinet minister in charge of Crown Indigenous Relations has apologized for a text she sent to the former justice minister, who is herself Indigenous and who calls that text racist. It started with this tweet from former Liberal MP Jody Wilson-Raybould. She says, with the horrific news out of Saskatchewan, our collective call again is for concrete transformative action. Justin Trudeau, if you care enough to make things right, stop your selfish jockeying for an election, which no one really wants, and do what you promised in 2018. She then tweeted this screenshot of the word pension with a question mark. 
a text she got from former colleague Carolyn Bennett, who is now the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations. With me from Ottawa is Mike LeCouture. Mike, start with some context for people about why the word pension is so loaded in this context. Yeah, it really is, Donna, and that's because Wilson Raybould has to hold on to her seat until October of this year in order to qualify for her lucrative MP pension, which only members of Parliament who have served at least six years are eligible for. Now, Wilson Raybould says the comment plays into racist stereotypes about Indigenous peoples that they are lazy and only want money. It was a private text that was shared very publicly, but still something you would not expect from the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, who has served in that role since 2015 when the Trudeau government was first elected. Now, Bennett's office said the minister was unavailable for an interview, but pointed to her apology on Twitter, which read in part, quote, I let interpersonal dynamics get the better of me and sent an insensitive and inappropriate comment. We spoke to Wilson Raybould today about the text and the apology. What happens to, to Carolyn Bennett uh, is certainly up to the Prime Minister to determine, but uh, I think that we should all take pause that we have a, a Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations whose uh, instinctive response is what she sent to me over um, uh, a text message, and, and I am not shy to call out systemic racism where it exists. Now, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has said there is no more important relationship than the one between Canada and Indigenous peoples. However, Wilson Raybould says her experience as a former minister suggests otherwise. To have as her instinctive response to say something like that to me, and I haven't received a text message from her since December of 2018, is reflective of some of the internal dynamics that... Um, take place within this government. Now, Wilson Raybould says this incident and the tragic events of this week could serve as an opportunity for the Minister Bennett and the Trudeau government to look themselves in the mirror and a, be a bit self-reflective. Donna? All right, Mike LeCouture in Ottawa, thank you. A forensic report into the downing of a passenger jet over Iran in January 2020 says Iran's account of what happened is disingenuous, misleading and deliberately ignores key factors. The Iranian military shot down the Ukraine International Airlines jetliner minutes after takeoff from the airport in Tehran. Iran claims it was an accident. The report revealed Iran showed a blatant disregard for air safety by failing to provide any information to airlines about its military activities when it launched a missile strike against a pair of U.S. bases in Iraq hours before the airliner was shot down. Foreign Affairs Minister Mark Garneau says Iran needs to make full reparations for causing the disaster. There's a limit to our patience in terms of waiting for Iran to get back to us. Uh, we are going to remind them on a regular basis, uh, but uh, I'm not going to give you a, an exact date on, on when, if they haven't replied to us, that we're going to uh, uh, move to another uh, approach. All 176 crew and passengers on board were killed when the plane was shot down, including 138 people with ties to Canada. Stanley Cup fever is spreading through Montreal. Coming up, Habs fans hold their breath for tonight's pivotal Game 6. Hope for the Habs is almost palpable in Montreal tonight. Montreal Canadiens face off against the Vegas Golden Knights in Game 6 of the semifinals. And though there are still some public health restrictions in place, the town is ready to party. Dan Spector reports. La Fête Nationale, also known as Saint-Jean-Baptiste Day. It's Quebec's most important holiday, a time to celebrate the province's unique culture and the French language. We're just kind of a small population in the millions of Anglophone and we're still uh, fighting for it. Because of COVID, the usual parade was replaced by a series of outdoor exhibitions at Montreal's Quartier des Spectacles. And while usually you'd only see a sea of blue and white flags, there's quite a bit more red around this year too. Go Rams, go! 
As if there wasn't enough joy surrounding St. Jean, things opening up as cases fall, the city is ready to boil over with excitement about the Montreal Canadiens. A win in Game 6 against the Vegas Golden Knights in front of the home crowd at the Bell Centre would push the Habs to the Stanley Cup Final for the first time in 28 years. It will be the perfect scenario uh, joint uh, with the games tonight uh, to have the Habs wins uh, on the St. Jean Baptiste. There's kind of an euphoric moment there. There's no time for an interview at this sports bar. They say the game's been sold out for over a week. We got here at noon to go eat at the cash to see the game tonight. Others have chosen the first come first serve model, but that doesn't mean people aren't trying to get reservations. I've had to put the phones on hold today because it's just non-stop. Facebook, Twitter, um, every form of uh, contact in the bar, they've been trying to get reservations. Meanwhile, some downtown electronics stores have boarded up their windows, fearing post-game mayhem, win or lose. You can feel the tension in the air tonight. Let's hope that everything goes fine. Police will be out in force, hoping a day full of joy ends the way it began. Dan Spector, Global News, Montreal. Still ahead, the search for dozens unaccounted for near Miami. This is what's left of a 12-story condo building that partially collapsed near Miami, Florida. About half the building is wiped out. It's not clear how many people were inside when it happened early this morning. At least one person is known to have died. 99 others are still unaccounted for. The main nephew was here with the wife and three small children. Two, six, and nine. You never lose hope. I'm just asking God because they're in the affected area. The problem is the building has literally pancaked. There's just feet in between stories where there were 10 feet. Uh, that is, uh, is heartbreaking. Work was being done on the building's roof, but it's not known yet if that played a role in the collapse. Former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin is set to be sentenced tomorrow in the murder of George Floyd. He could face anything from probation to decades in prison, though a lengthy sentence is what's expected. Jackson Prosco is in Minneapolis tonight. At the place where George Floyd was murdered, there's a nervous wait for the next move from the courts. All of America and the world saw what happened to Brother George Floyd just a few feet from where we're standing today. We saw a man lynched in, in modern time and we want to see justice. Justice, according to local activist Leslie Redmond, would be the maximum sentence for former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. In April, a jury found him guilty of murder and manslaughter. On Friday, a judge will decide how long he spends in prison. Anything less than 30 years is an injustice. It's a smack in the face. 30 years is what the prosecution is asking for. Chauvin's defense wants no jail time, just probation, arguing in an unapologetic pre-sentencing memo that he was simply performing his lawful duty in assisting other officers in the arrest of George Floyd. I just don't think he's going to surprise everyone with a low sentence tomorrow. Law professor Rachel Moran believes Judge Peter Cahill will lean on the side of a stiffer sentence after finding aggravating factors in Chauvin's conduct that allow him to go beyond state sentencing guidelines. The defense knows very well there is no way Mr. Chauvin is going to get probation. And so to make that request is a bit of a statement in itself. The state's attorney general has made a statement of his own, allowing anyone to submit an impact statement to the court to document how Floyd's death affected them. The court will also hear victim impact statements from the Floyd family. He was so much of a, a leader to us in the household. Similar to what George Floyd's brother delivered during the trial. No matter the sentence, Friday will not mark the end of Derek Chauvin's legal troubles. He still faces a separate federal civil rights investigation. Meanwhile, the other three officers involved in George Floyd's death will face their own joint trial in March. Donna. Jackson Prosco in Minneapolis tonight. Thanks. Stay with us. Global National is back in just a moment. The news today from Saskatchewan is chilling and hard to take in, but it's not really news. It's been known for years that there are unmarked graves and missing children at former Indian residential schools in Canada. 
A report called Unmarked Burials and Missing Children was written six years ago for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. You can find it online. It says death cast a long shadow. Aboriginal children in residential schools died at a far higher rate than school-aged children in the general population. For just under one-third of these deaths, the government and the schools did not record the name of the student who died. Due to limited government funding, students in most schools were malnourished, quartered in crowded and unsanitary facilities, poorly clothed and overworked. Students who died at school were rarely sent home unless their parents could afford to pay for transportation. The tragedy of the loss of children was compounded by the fact that burial places were distant or even unknown. That is Global National for this Thursday. Thanks for watching. We leave you tonight with words from Chief Delorme from the Cowess's First Nation about his hopes for the future. In Canada one day, hopefully when my four-year-old is old, we'll have reconciliation through and through, through the spirit and intent so Indigenous people and Canada can thrive on this land together. We enjoy working with Canada. We enjoy our settler Canadian friends and neighbours. What we don't enjoy is that life is better off the reserve than on the reserve. And we don't want that for our children. The truth is there. Everybody has to reset maybe the ignorance or the accidental racism that the education system has told before it is already being changed and investment in healing from the core outwards has to happen once truth is given and told and accepted then reconciliation will prevail